Hey, good morning, everybody. Great to see you in the house on this rainy Sunday morning. Hey, let me ask you something. When you first meet someone, and let's say you're going to have dinner together, or you're going to have lunch or coffee, and you've not, you really don't know them, how do you get the conversation started? You know, what do you do? What do you, what do you say? Uh, I, when, whenever I meet somebody for the first time, and my friends kind of make fun of me for this, because I say this almost regularly, uh, I'll sit down with somebody, I'll say, so, tell me your story. Tell me your story. And, and usually they're like, okay, so like, where do you want to start? I'm like, just start at the beginning. Where were you born? What was your family like? How many siblings did you have? And, and it's funny, once, once they kind of get started, then they, they, they kind of get into the rhythm of it because people love to share their stories. And every story is fascinating. Every story is unique and different. And really, as followers of Jesus, we need to be really good at sharing our story. And I'm talking about our Christ story, how we came to faith in Christ. Your kids should know it. Your grandkids should know it. Your friends should know your story of how you came uh, to Christ. Psalm 107 verse 2 says, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. But in the, in the CSB, it says it this way, let the redeemed of the Lord tell their story. Don't you love that? Man, we should just be good at telling our story. We sang that song. This is my story. This is my song. But do you know how to share your story? That's what we're going to talk about uh, today. And you may say, well, Craig, why is it so important to share our story? Well, the reason why it's important is because people need to see how you came to know and follow Jesus so they can see themselves coming to know and follow Jesus as well. So your story plays an integral part of helping someone come to faith in Jesus. So once you get your Bible, once you open it up with me to Acts chapter 26. Acts 26 is where we're going to be uh, this morning. Now, <coughs> let me... Um, let me kind of set the stage here for you. Um, the Apostle Paul is on trial. He's on trial. In Acts chapter 21, Paul was accused of bringing a Gentile into the restricted area of the temple complex in Jerusalem, something he did not do. But because of the accusation, a, a murderous crowd began to swirl around him, and they tried to kill him on the spot. He was literally rescued by soldiers, Roman soldiers, that uh, protected him and then remanded him to Governor Felix, who was the Roman governor procreator of, uh, of Israel at the time. And he had him incarcerated way up in the north at Caesarea Maritima, which is right on the Mediterranean Sea up in the north part of Israel. And then subsequently, Felix had a trial. He invited all the religious leaders to bring their accusations, present their evidence. Paul made a defense. They did not present a good case. Paul was clearly not in the wrong. And yet, Felix left him in prison, often bringing him out to talk to Paul, and secretly hoping that Paul would offer him a bribe so he could let him go. Now, Felix has stepped down, and a new governor has come into power. His name is Festus. And Festus looks over his outstanding cases. See, there's a guy, Paul, here that's still on the books. So he has a second trial. Again, he calls the religious leaders up from Jerusalem, and they present their case, their evidence. Festus, again, doesn't see anything wrong with Paul, and yet Paul remains there in prison. Now, Paul's going to be in prison up in Caesarea uh, Maritima for two years, two years under this false accusation. Then finally... Uh, a king named King Agrippa II is going to come visit Festus, the new governor. Now, follow with me. King Agrippa was the last of the Herodian dynasty. Whenever you read the Gospels, you read Herod to this and Herod to this and Herod to this. You think it's all the same guy. It's not. These are, these are uh, father, son, father, son all the way through. There's a Herodian dynasty. So this guy is the last of the Herodian dynasty. Now, the, pretty much Israel is governed by Roman governors or procreators, but they allowed Agrippa, because of his family line and heritage and so on, to govern a little small piece up in the north. But he was helpful to the Romans because he was Jewish and he could kind of negotiate Jewish issues. And so here is Agrippa. He comes in to visit Festus, the new Roman governor, and he's like, hey, you know, I got this case. 
This guy named Paul, and it's, it's a religious thing, and I don't really understand all that. You're Jewish. How about you sit in on a, a trial, if you will, or at least hear him out, and, and maybe you can advise me on what to do with this guy. So Herod uh, Agrippa is quite happy to be brought into this situation. And so this is what we find in chapter 26. Paul is going to stand before King Agrippa and his sister Bernice and the governor Festus and a host of other leaders in a theater. Now, here's what you need to understand about Agrippa, all right? King Agrippa II, right? His father, King Agrippa I, actually killed James the apostle. His father before him, King Herod Antipas, killed John the Baptist and also sat in judgment over Jesus. Uh, his father before that killed all the baby boys in Bethlehem. So this is like, uh, this is like a mobster family, all right? He, he's like, I got an offer you can't refuse, all right? I mean, you can see, now, now knowing that history, you would, I, I don't know about you, I'd be very intimidated, all right? This is not a good record. They're, every one of the Herods, you know, kills some, you know, prominent Christian, you know, so I, I'm not so sure. But Paul is going to stand before King Agrippa with great boldness. Now, I want you to kind of get this picture. They're, they're in a theater. At the end of chapter 25, it says that Agrippa comes in with great pomp. Uh, the Greek word for pomp there is fantasia, with great fantasy, with great fanfare. Here he comes parading in. All the leaders are there. Herod is, is in a royal robe. Paul is in rags. Herod has a crown on his head. Paul is in shackles. Herod uh, is the epitome of power, and yet Paul appears very, very powerless. And yet in that moment that would be so intimidating, in that moment, Paul is as bold as a lion, and Paul boldly shares the gospel of Jesus Christ. And Paul does so through his story. He leverages his story. Now, we're going to look at his story this morning. And we're going to look at it as a model for how you can share your story. Now, listen, I, I hope that you're never going to stand trial. I hope that you're never going to stand trial for your faith. There are Christians all over the world that are, even today, standing on trial for their faith. I hope that you never have to do that. But I want you to understand that you are being judged every day. As a follower of Jesus, people are watching you to see, does your walk match your talk? Are you really legit? Do you really follow Jesus. And so we need to really get good at, in that context of sharing our story. Gustav Freytag was a 19th century novelist from Germany, and he studied lots of novels. He went back to some of the classics, some of the greats, and he, he discovered that they all followed a similar pattern. He developed what is called Freytag's Pyramid, and basically, he said the, the story arc goes something like this. Usually, the introduction, then there's a rising action, and then it leads to the climax of the story or the main uh, conflict of the story, and then it comes down to a falling action and then to some kind of resolution at the end. Now, what's interesting, I share that with you simply because Paul kind of follows this similar pattern when he shares a story. He's going, to talk, he's going to have a little introduction, then he's going to talk about what his life was like before Christ, that's the ascending uh, action, then how he met Jesus, and then the descending action, what has happened since he met Christ, and then he's going to offer some kind of uh, uh, an extension of uh, an offer uh, for someone to come to faith in Jesus. So th this is a good model for you and I to, to share our story. So let's, uh, let's take a look at this. Let's look at the introduction of Paul. And this is found in chapter 26, verses 1 through 3. Uh, this is the word of God. Amen? Agrippa said to Paul, you have permission to speak for yourself. Then Paul stretched out his hand and began his defense. I consider myself fortunate that is before you, King Agrippa, that I make my defense today against all the accusations of the Jews, especially since you are very knowledgeable about all the Jewish customs and controversies. Therefore, I beg you to listen to me patiently. So when, when Jesus was talking to his disciples, he said, listen, don't worry when you're brought into trial. Don't worry what you're going to say. The Holy Spirit's going to give you the words to say. This is exactly what's happening right here. 
I mean, Paul couldn't be in a more intimidating environment, right? More intimidating. I mean, here he is right before the men who could take his life. And yet Paul uh, says, I'm eager. I'm fortunate to share with you. I'm ready to share with you. I can't wait to share with you what God has done in my life. Now, let me ask you something. How ready are you to share? I mean, if this morning I said, you know what, I got this cough, Not, you know, don't feel very good. Why don't I just put the mic out and we're just, gonna, you got one minute to share your story. Ready, go. Would you know how to share your story? Could you say it quickly, succinctly, and powerfully? Well, we're going to learn here how to do just that. We need to be ready and eager to share our story. Think about it. Lawyers prepare witnesses uh, before they take the stand so that their testimony is clear. In the same way, you are a witness of Jesus Christ. And you need to be prepared and ready to share what God has done in your life. All right. So the first thing Paul does is he talks about uh, how he used to be. First thing you need to do is share who you used to be. Look at verse 4. All the Jews know my way of life from my youth, which was spent from the beginning among my own people and in Jerusalem. They have known me for a long time. And if they're willing to testify that according to the strictest sect of our religion, I live as a Pharisee. I love, he, he goes, you know, these people know me for a long time. He's probably pointing over them. These guys, I've known these guys for a long, long time. They know me since I was very, very young. They will tell you that I was a strict Jew. They will tell you that I was very devout. They will tell you that I even rose to the high level of a Pharisee. There's no dispute of my devotion to the Jewish faith. Paul said in Galatians 1.14, he said, I advanced in Judaism beyond many contemporaries among my people because I was extremely zealous for the traditions of my ancestors. In Acts 22, Paul told them that he was born in Tarsus, but he was actually raised in Jerusalem and studied under Gamaliel, who was one of the greatest, most revered rabbis of the time. In fact, when Gamaliel died, the Talmud says, quote, the glory of the law ceased, end quote. That's how revered Gamaliel was. And so here's Paul saying, man, I, I, I'm a Jew of all Jews. I'm as devoted as they are. I study on the highest, brightest people in minds. What, what is Paul doing? He's establishing some connection with, with Herod. He, he's saying, Agrippa, you're, you're a Jew, I'm a Jew. All right, we, we got the same background. We, we know the same things. You understand these things. Now, I just say this because when you're sharing kind of what your life was like before Christ, you might be able to find common ground. You might say, oh, man, we all grew up in the same area, you know, or we went to the same school, or, or, or we like the same, you know, you can find common ground. And if there's common ground there, then that will help you in sharing your story. But then Paul turns to talk about what he understands about Jesus. Look at verse 6. He says, and now I stand on trial because of the hope in what God promised to our ancestors, the promise our 12 tribes hope to reach as they earnestly serve him night and day. King Agrippa, I am being accused by the Jews because of this hope. Why do any of you consider it incredible that God raises the dead? In fact, I myself was convinced that it was necessary to do many things in opposition to the name of Jesus of Nazareth. I actually did this in Jerusalem, and I locked up many of the saints in prison since I had received authority for that from the chief priests. And when they were put to death, I was in agreement against them. In all the synagogues, I often punished them and tried to make them blaspheme since I was terribly enraged at them. I pursued them even to foreign cities. He like, listen, not only was I devout, I hated Christians. I hated them. I thought that they were trying to lead people astray from God. I hated Christians so much so that I pursued them. I sought to put them in jail. I tried to make them blaspheme. And even when they were put to death, I cast my lot against them. In fact, King Agrippa, I'm just like those guys. Like those guys that are accusing me, I'm just like them. And just as angry as they are, that's how I was. Now, what is Paul doing? He's talking about what his life was like before he met Jesus. How far, far from God he actually was. Now, think about it. What was your life like before you met Jesus? What was it like? What was your background? Uh, were you religious? Were you irreligious? Did you grow up in church? Did you not grow up in church? Did you grow up in another uh, religious tradition? 
Were you eager? Were you apathetic? Were you hostile? What, what was your attitude generally like uh, before you came uh, to know Jesus? You know, I've had friends of mine who were, you know, they had no religion at all in their background. I've had some that were just partiers and didn't give it much thought. I've had some that grew up in church. You know, for me, I grew up in church uh, as a, a church kid. My dad was uh, a, a worship pastor, and I, I grew up hearing about Jesus from my youth. I grew up in church. I was in the choir in the alto section nine months before I was born. You'll get it in just a minute, all right? Anyway, uh, and uh, so, I mean, I, this is how I grew up, but I didn't know Christ. I heard people talk about knowing God. I didn't know him, but I saw what Christian people were like, and my attitude toward Christians was always very favorable because of my parents' influence. So how did your story start? That's, you need clarity on that. What was your life like before Jesus? And then you move to the next part, and that is what Freytag calls the climax, the pinnacle, the important part, and that is how you met Jesus. And Paul shifts gears here in verse 12 to talk about exactly how he met Jesus. Now listen, this is important. This is the important part of your story. So you need to slow it down and be sure that you're clear about how you came to Christ. There are some people when they get to this part, they, they spend a lot of time on the front end of what their life was like before, and they get to Jesus and they kind of skip, skip through a couple of the details and they move on. And this is where you really want to settle down and tell specifically in detail how you came to Christ. Now I want you to listen to how Paul does it. Notice the details that he gives and how he meets Jesus. Look at verse 12. He said, I was traveling to Damascus under these circumstances with authority and a commission from the chief priests. King Agrippa, while on the road at midday, I saw a light from heaven brighter than the sun shining around me and those traveling with me. And we all fell to the ground. And I heard a voice speaking to me in Aramaic, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It is hard for you to kick against the goads. I asked, who are you, Lord? And the Lord replied, I am Jesus, the one you are persecuting. But get up and stand on your feet, for I have appeared to you for this purpose, to appoint you as a servant and as a witness of what you have seen and will see in me. I will rescue you from your people and from the Gentiles. I am sending you to them to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God, that they may have may receive forgiveness of sins and share among those who are sanctified by faith in me. All right, man, you talk about a dramatic story, right? I mean, I'm on the road and I just look slight and I fall to the ground. And he says, why are you persecuting me? Who are you? I am Jesus. And it's really interesting. He says, Paul, he says, Saul, why do you kick against the goads? You know what a goad is? You know, if you're not a shepherd, you probably don't know that word, but a goad was actually a stick that a shepherd would have that with a sharp point at the end of it, and they would, if they're trying to get a sheep to move, and he's not moving, they would just give him a little jab-jab with that sharp point, and that would get his attention, and he would, he would get up and move. This was a standard shepherd stick. What is Jesus saying? It's hard to kick against the goads. What is he saying? He's like, Saul, it's hard because you've been resisting my prompting. I've been poking at you. I've been directing you, and you've been resisting me. Why? Listen, the truth is, there's some in this room there you're resisting. You're kicking against the goats. You're, you're, maybe God's brought a, a godly person in your life that's trying to share with you the gospel, and you're like, ah, I, don't, I don't need that. I don't want that. And you're resisting, you're resisting, you're resisting. You're kicking against the goats. Maybe, maybe you heard a gospel message from a pastor or maybe on social media, and, you, and God's just moving in your heart. And, and there's a drawing, but you're just kicking against the goats. I found that people that are the most hostile toward the gospel are the ones that God's been prompting and pushing them, and they're resisting it with this violent force because God is really goading them, prompting them to actually come to faith in him. What were the goads that Paul was resisting? We're not really sure. Jesus doesn't say. Maybe it was the, the actual spread of the gospel, and he sees it, and he knows that maybe in his heart, and he's thinking, maybe this is really true. Maybe it was the death of Stephen, the first Christian martyr, that Paul was there, and he saw this man, this godly man, die for his faith, and he probably couldn't get him out of his head that this Christian would die like this for his faith. 
Whatever the case was, Jesus said, you're resisting me, Paul. You're resisting me. But at this point, Jesus knocked him to the ground and he got his attention. And Paul was very, very clear about how he gave his life to Christ. So let me ask you something. Are you clear on when you gave your life to Christ? Are you clear? You know, I've talked to some people that go, well, you know, I just don't really know. I can't tell you the day or the time. You know, I just kind of know that I'm a Christian. But can you point to a time when you were far from God? Can you point to a time when you heard the gospel? Can you point to a time when you were convicted of your sin? Can you point to a time when you asked Jesus by faith to forgive you and to come into your life? Can you point to a time when your life, uh, when you met Christ? You know, if I said, uh, you ever met Tom Brady? Oh man, yeah, I have, absolutely. I met Tom. Well, where was it? Well, man, I was at this deal and we came, came out of the restaurant. And we bumped into each other. I mean, you could tell me specifically a time you met a celebrity, but can you tell me specifically the time you met Jesus? And be very specific. When was it? How was it? Who was there? What went on? And the reason, again, is because when you're specific and clear, then that person that's hearing it can then be clear what it means to come to faith in Jesus. For me, I was a young boy. I was sitting in, the, in, the, in a pew just like kind of where you are today. The pastor was preaching the gospel, and I'd heard the gospel multiple times from my parents, but that day I just heard it different. And I, and I just heard that God, Jesus died on a cross for me, and, and I felt like, you know, if, if he died and loved me enough to die for me, that I wanted to live for him. And I remember I was feel very convicted of my sin, even as a young boy, convicted of my need for forgiveness. So much so that after the service was over, I ran down a pastor, and I said, I, I need to give my life to Christ right now. And so we went back into the auditorium. Everybody was cleared out. It was on the front row uh, that we got down on our knees, and I asked Jesus to come into my life. I can tell you where, how old I was. I can tell you where I was. Uh, I can tell you the moment that I gave my life to Christ. And so here is, here is Paul doing the same thing. He's giving you specifics on how he came to Christ. But he doesn't stop there. He goes on to share how Jesus has changed his life. So this is kind of that descending action in Freytag's uh, uh, pyramid there. He's going to talk about the difference Jesus has made. Look at verse 19. So then, King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision. It said, I preached to those in Damascus first, and to those in Jerusalem, and in the region of Judea, and to the Gentiles, that they should repent and turn to God and do works worthy of repentance. For this reason, the Jews seized me in the temple and were trying to kill me. To this very day, I have helped, I've had help from God, and I stand to testify to both small and great, saying nothing other than what the prophets and Moses said would take place. In other words, he's saying, you know, this very reason, you know, I've been spreading the gospel, man. I'm doing what God told me to do. Jesus said to be his witness, and I've been doing that. My life has been radically changed. I mean, you can't, you got to give him credit, you know, talk about a dramatic testimony. Paul had one, right? I mean, he went from hating Christians to loving Christians. He went from uh, trying to stomp out churches to planting churches. He went from trying to stop the movement to fu fueling the movement. And so his life was dramatically changed as a result of it. And listen, if, if you have given your life to Christ, there should be some difference in your life. I've heard people say, well, people never change. But the gospel says otherwise. The gospel says otherwise. If any man is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old is gone and the new has come. And so listen, if you've given your life to Christ, then there should be a difference. Now, now listen, the difference may not be just hugely dramatic, especially if you gave your life to Christ early on. If you gave your Christ as a young child, you may not be super dramatic like Paul, you know. I remember hearing the story of a uh, country church, and they were having testimony night on a Sunday night. And so they had the mic out, and people were finding through, telling their testimonies, and then they'd sing songs in between. This one granny gets up. She's very feeble. She gets up to the mic, and she says, I want to praise the Lord Jesus. Everybody says, amen. For he delivered me. And then she goes on to talk about all this wild living and, and drunkenness and immorality and all these kind of sensational sins. And everybody's like, ooh, granny did all those things. And, and she got to the end of it. She said, I want to praise him because he delivered me from all that. Because I gave my life to Christ when I was a young girl, I didn't have to go through any of those things. Isn't that great? Listen, maybe that's you. Man, God just delivered you as a, as a youngster. And now you can, you know, whenever I see kids that are baptized, man, I praise God for that. 
that, that God has saved them young. They have their whole life to live for God, right? They have their whole life to be a witness for the Lord Jesus. So don't be ashamed of that testimony. But you need to be able to share the difference Jesus has made. Maybe you were once afraid of death, and now you're not afraid of death anymore. Once you had, you, you're just living for yourself and for what you could get out of life, and now you realize there's a greater purpose in life. I, I don't know what your story is, but there needs to be a difference that Jesus has made that is compelling. You know, for me, I gained my life to Christ when I was a young boy. Now, I, I had a lot of my sinning to do after that, right? But, but I, I, I thank the Lord as I come back to, to that moment in my life that Jesus saved me. And uh, I can just say that even right at the very beginning, after I gave my life to Christ, there was a difference. I, I had a hunger for the Word of God. I had a desire to please God. And there were times when that swelled and times when that waned, but I, I praise God that he's patient with me. And even in those times when I did fail him, that God's forgiveness was new every morning. So listen, what is the change? How has Jesus changed your life? So you want to start with what your life was like before Christ, then how you met Jesus specifically, and then the difference he's made. Now notice in verse 23, he really lands on the gospel. Look at verse 23. He said, the Messiah would suffer, and that as uh, the first to rise from the dead, he would proclaim light to the people and to the Gentiles. That's really the essence of the gospel. He said, this is all what the Old Testament talks about. The Messiah is going to come. He's going to suffer. He's going to rise again. He's going to proclaim faith and life. Now he's a Jewish people with the Gentiles. He said, this is all that the Old Testament is driving to. And Paul nails the gospel right there. And as you share your story, you need to be sure that you don't skip over the gospel, all right? Uh, be sure that you share, it was the death and burial and resurrection of Jesus that changed my life, forgave my sin, and made me a new person in Christ. And then we get down to the, the invitation or the response. Look at verse 24. And as he was saying these things in, the de in his defense, Festus exclaimed in a loud voice, you are out of your mind, Paul. Too much study is driving you mad. But Paul replied, I'm not out of my mind, most excellent Festus. On the contrary, I'm speaking words of truth and good judgment. For the king knows about these matters, and I can speak boldly to them, for I'm convinced that none of these has escaped his notice since this was not done in a corner. I love what Festus goes. He's like, listen, he goes, Paul, you're just crazy. Paul, you just, you just, <coughs> Paul, you just lost it. <clears throat> You're just lost, awesome, man. You're just nuts. All this studying has gone, affected your brain somehow. You're like a, in a padded cell, you know? And, and Paul is like, no, 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 I'm not crazy. In fact, he goes on to say, uh, what I'm telling you is true, and the CSB says sound judgment. I don't know what your version says, but it literally means uh, it is it is sane. What I'm telling you is true and sane. What I'm telling you is true and sound. It is true and rational. It is true and logical. And then he goes on to point to, I'm sure, uh, Agrippa there and say, the king knows these things. These things have not escaped his notice. All these things, the death of Jesus, the resurrection of Jesus, the empty tomb, this was not done in a corner. This was public knowledge. These are the facts. You know, you might have people tell you when you share your story, I just think you're nuts. I just think this whole Jesus thing is just a bunch of made up. And uh, I think you're crazy to say that you believe these things. And if you hear that, then just do what Paul did. Just point to the facts. Point back to the historical accounts. Point back to the eyewitness testimonies. Because these facts will hold their own. All right? They'll hold their own. And then look again at what Paul then says to Agrippa, verse 20, 27. King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know you believe. Agrippa said to Paul, are you going to persuade me to become a Christian so easily? I wish before God, replied Paul, that whether easy or with difficulty, not only you, but all who listen to me today might become as I am except for these chains. Don't you love that? I just love the fact that Paul is so bold. I mean, think, think about it. He's on trial for his life. Here's the king and the, and the Roman provincial governor. 
They, they have the power in that moment to take his life. And Paul is not going, oh, you know, uh, he's not backpedaling. He's not watering it down. He's not kind of making excuses. Well, maybe I kind of got this wrong or it's just kind of how I see it or it's just my perspective. He doesn't do any of that. I mean, it's like he just surges with boldness, I believe, filled with the Holy Spirit in that moment to boldly declare that his life has been changed by Jesus. Now listen, you have an opportunity to do the same thing. When was the last time you shared with somebody how you gave it off to Christ? Let me just start off easy. Do your kids know how you came to Christ? Have you shared that story with them? Do your grandkids know how you came to faith in Jesus? Do your best friends know how you came to Christ? Do your coworkers or the people you play golf with or your hunting buddy know how you came to Christ? This is the best story of your life. This is your story. Oh, I, let me take that back. It's not really your story. It's God's story of what he's doing in your life. It's God's story of what he's doing in your life. And we need to be ready to share it. Remember Psalm 107, verse 2, let the redeemed of the Lord tell their story. So let me just wrap up this way. If you're a Christian here today, I want to challenge you to write your story down. This is your homework. Yeah, you're back in school. This is your homework assignment for the week. I want you to write out your story only on one page, not front and back either, just one page. Write your story. Give me a paragraph of, of what your life was like before Christ, a paragraph with details, how you gave life to Christ, a paragraph of the difference Jesus has made in your life. You should be able to have that written out. And by the way, if I've got any connect group leaders in the house today, I want to throw out a challenge to all my connect group leaders today. I want you to have everybody in your connect group start sharing their story, one a week, all right? Write it out. They can read it. But, but if you just think about it, if every person got to share their story over the course of several weeks, not only would you be encouraged, but they will be trained and prepared to share their story when they have the opportunity, all right? Be ready to share your story. Write it out. And listen, maybe you're here today and you don't know that you could do that. Maybe you say, Craig, I'm not really sure what I would write. I don't really know that I've got clarity on when I came to Christ or the difference, I don't know, I don't know what I would say. Well, then listen to me. Today, your story can change. Today could be that pivot point, the climax of your story. Yeah, God's been bringing you. He's been goading you. He's preparing you. He's been leading you. He got you here on a rainy Sunday. God's been moving you. But this is the moment that you can meet Jesus. God's writing your story. And if you turn to Christ, he'll write a new chapter. He'll start a new chapter in your story that will glorify him. Let's bow our heads together. Maybe you're here today and you say, Pastor, I don't know that I've given my life to Christ. I don't know that I have a story to tell. I sang that song, this is my story, but I don't know that I really have a story. But I want to have a story. I want to know, I want to know Jesus. And I want to be able to share that I know Jesus. I want to give you an opportunity to do that right now, just with your heads bowed, nobody looking around. If you're here today and you say, Pastor, just pray for me. I, God's working on my heart, and I need Christ. I need Christ. I want to have a story to tell. I want you to just lift up your hand, and I'm not going to call you out, but I'll just see your hand, and I'll, I'll lead you in a prayer right where you're seated to come to faith in Jesus. Just right now, lift up your hand. Pastor, pray for me. I need Christ. I'm not sure that I know the Lord, but I want to be sure. I'm not sure that I have a story to tell, but I want to have a story to tell. Just lift your hand. Pastor, pray for me. All right. Okay. Okay. You can put your hand down. Just right where you are, just say, Lord Jesus, I know I've sinned against you. I know I've gone my own way but I believe you died on a cross for me and you rose again from the dead. So I'm asking you, please forgive me. Please wash me clean. Please make me new. Today I choose to follow you. Lord, thank you for loving me. Thank you for forgiving me. Lord, I thank you for every person in this room today. 
Lord, I thank you for those that are the redeemed. Lord, I pray we would share our story, that we'd look for opportunities to just share your story, what you've done in our life, how, what our life was like and how we met you and the difference you made. Lord, I pray we share it regularly, we share it often, we share it boldly, we share it eagerly. And that, Lord, through our story, people would be pointed to you, Jesus. Give us that boldness of Paul, that eagerness. And, Lord, use us for your glory. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.